The views expressed, opinions given, and any communication made between the hosts and guests of What Are You Afraid of Horror and Paranormal Show do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of Para-X Radio, EMC Network, or all services that play this show. The hosts and services are not responsible for the actions of their guests, and the original rights of all intellectual property is retained by the creator, and all work is used with either permission or Creative Commons license. The show is for entertainment purposes only. I'm horror author T. Fox Dunham. And I'm horror author and filmmaker Phil Thomas. And tonight we're asking you... What are you afraid of? Afraid of is back. Yes. What are you afraid we of? Are, paranormal show. We we're back. We're back. <laughs> Episode 140 Greg Bear and Bear's Ghost with the return of science fiction legend Greg Bear. Part two with this interview. We did part one on episode 139 and we didn't want to lose any of the content. So we broke it off into two parts. And you know what? You can listen to both parts individually and it's still a great interview. Absolutely. How long did we record for that day? I think it was... Uh, well, 90 minutes. 90, at least an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah 90 it minutes. Was, it right. was up there. And of course, uh, when I edit the interviews, um, I cut out superfluous material or material the audience might not find interesting, or we're right. just kind of chatting with our, you know, with our guy. And we still got like two episodes out of that one. Just, you know, it's a, it's a great interview with an iconic, legendary, one of the people that built modern science fiction. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's incredible. He really is. He's a legend. He is a Plain legend. Simple. So how are you doing, Phil? I'm hanging in there, mm-hmm. trying to make the best of everything. I yeah. really am trying to keep busy. A lot of, I'm doing a lot of writing. Oh, good. Articles for Hardcore Droid yeah. and also just, you know, I'm, I've been working on my manuscripts too. I've been cleaning them up, mm-hmm. doing some editing back. I, I really went through a really intensive sweep mm-hmm. of the Pope predicament last week. Right. It took me like four days. I worked on it like five hours, like each day. It was mm-hmm. like really, yeah. Um, but I cleaned up so much and it's so much tighter now. And I'm going to do the same thing with um, Worst Afterlife Ever. Excellent. I'm going to start that this weekend. Oh, good. So you're cleaning house, sprinkling yeah. for yeah. writers, you know. Cleaning house for writers, exactly. Yes. Cool. Yeah, you got it. We're back with episode 140. Now, in this episode, we're going to be playing a ghost story that Rebecca Brown sent in years ago to the Fox True Ghost Story Project, which was sort of the precursor to What Are You Afraid Of when I was just doing blogs and having people send in their ghost stories. And I was always hoping we could do a podcast one day with it. And here we are. And then we're going to play part two of our interview with Greg Bear with an excerpt from his book, Lines of Darkness, which is read by our wonderful English folk singer, David Walton. Now, for the people on Para-X Radio, we have to shorten these episodes a little bit, but we do an extended version, which you can find at our website at www.whatareyoufraidofpodcast.com or find it on Liz, Libsyn or one of the many podcast services out there. You can We're everywhere at this point. Yeah, we are. Yeah. But before we get into that, did, did you see the UFO video? Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, that was that was pretty. I watched it a few times. I kept watching. I watched it for a good like three minutes straight, mm-hmm. and it loops. It keeps looping. Yeah. But um. But yeah, it it's uh, yeah. I, I don't know what to make of that. I mean, the the Pentagon it, re- released it as unclassified footage. It's it's unidentified aerial phenomenon. There are three videos that were taken. They've been circulating on YouTube for years, and finally they had to get out in front of it and release it. Because there were a lot of rumors about it, even 
Even our esteemed President Trump said, I just wonder if it's real because it's a hell of a video. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It is a hell of a video. Mm-hmm. It really is. I'm like, I was, I kept watching it and it's, it's, it's like this little formation and it's, it's circling like a fleet and it's rotating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What, I mean, what do you think it is? I mean, I, it looks to me like something well, I've never seen before. I, I'm looking at it and it does look like a fleet of ships, but mm-hmm. it could also be meteors coming in or mm. a low orbit satellite. And sometimes they can refract against the gases in the upper atmosphere and create a a spectral illusion and you're seeing three or four and they look exactly the same exactly in formation and they move the same way because it's one object right so that could be it or aliens it could be yeah it it could be it might not be a ufo at all it could be Mm -hmm. there could be some very logical like you were just saying explanation for it uh i mean let me ask you um i don't think i've ever asked you this before do you, do you believe in aliens, UFOs? I believe in aliens. I'm not so sure about UFOs. Okay. So you're not sure if they actually are here kind of monitoring us? Well, we're in a we're in a really distant corner of the universe. Like if, if the Milky Way galaxy was the United States of America, we're we're out in the Ozarks. We're out in <laughs> I mean, we're out on one of the west we're out on one of the arms and we're in the middle of nowhere. And it's just, I just don't know if extraterrestrial life is going to develop warp drive, going to create these astronomical amount of energies to go faster than the speed of light. And then, you know, go visit your aunt and uncle who live in the middle of Montana. Right. (laughs) I'm not sure about that. Right. Unless they're coming for something, unless they want something from us, which who knows. And, and it's always somewhere out in Montana or somewhere in that region. Right. It's always some, some poor... Poor, you know, guy, some hillbilly or someone up in the hills. And the <laughs> aliens moral... <laughs> appear to him and then stick things in him. Right. Yeah. You never hear of this in New York City. No. No, you of course know? not. I mean, they have their own freak show going on there, so they don't need aliens. But, you know. <laughs> but this is What Are You Afraid of? Hard Paranormal Show, episode 140. Greg Bear is back, of course, and Bear's Ghost. Now, we are going to pause to play Bear's Ghost. Recorded by our beloved David Walton. And this is What Are You Afraid Of? We're on Parix Radio Friday nights at 9 p.m. And check out our website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com where I'm going to put up a link to that video for our fans. But we'll be right back. What Are You Afraid Of? Hi, I'm Tim Wagner, Bram Stoker Award-winning author. Hashtag Grave Girls. This is Katrina Weidman of Destination America's Paranormal Lockdown. This is Jim Chambers. I'm the author of The Engines of Sacrifice. This is Jasper Barr, award-winning author of The Final Cut. And you're listening to What Are You Afraid Of? What Are You Afraid Of? To What Are You Afraid Of? What Are You Afraid Of? Love it. Fan, fan toxic, please. Fan toxic. Bears, Ghosts. Submitted by Rebecca Brown of Cardiff, Wales, United Kingdom, and read by David Walton. When I first saw a ghost, I must have been about seven or eight. He was a relatively short man dressed in dark green, who stood in the corner of the room and admired his own fingernails. There was nothing frightening about him, nothing intimidating. I liked his hat and told him as much. Mostly, he ignored me. That was the first time. It wasn't the last time I saw something, or even the last time I saw that man in particular. There were regular visitors and occasionals who made an appearance. Mostly, they ignored me. There was a man with a wood axe once, who brought the blade down as if to cut me. I don't think he saw me, and I don't think he meant to hurt me. In his reality, there was wood. He cut it. It wasn't pleasant, though. There were a few unusuals, too. Things which didn't make sense. From time to time I saw people who were almost definitely alive. Usually 
A little bit of investigation found that they were sleeping at the time or otherwise unconscious. Maybe they wandered. Maybe they were thinking of me. I don't know. I still see things you might class as ghosts sometimes. Mostly, they still ignore me. When they don't, they're rarely threatening. I've encouraged some of them to make their way to wherever it is they're meant to be. But that isn't always appropriate. Some of them, I think, are just echoes. A fading trail. There's nothing left to go because they already went a long time ago. Rat! Rat! Where are you going? I'm going back to the paranormal view, back where I belong. Please, please, take me with you. No, I'm through with everything here. I want to see if there's something left in life I haven't explored. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, Rhett, Rhett, don't run to them. They talk about ghosts and hauntings, UFOs and all kind of supernatural scary stuff. You'll never understand, will you, Scarlet? No! Well, that's your misfortune. Rhett, 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 if you go, where shall I go? What shall I do? Frankly, my dear, Line. Oh, you've you got to be line. kidding. That's the Paranormal View with your host, Henry Foister, Jeffrey Gould, and Barbara Duncan, every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the Para-X Radio Network. We're back, kitties. What are you afraid of? Guess what, Fox? What? We're back. We... Good <laughs> God, man! We are back. So yeah, we are. So yesterday, uh, we were doing laundry. We're getting it done. We do about two loads a week. We have a machine that a couple of the tenants use and a dryer in the basement of the main building. We go down. My wife's been doing laundry because I've been afraid to be contaminated by the virus, so I've been hiding out in my apartment. So she puts the laundry in. She takes it out of the washer. She puts it into the dryer. She puts a second load into the washer, starts it up, goes over to the dryer, and discovers that the corn slot has jammed. Oh, oh, that's not good. No, no. And it will not release. Oh. So not only could we not use the dryer, but no one else can use it either. And there was nothing we could do. There's no staff here. Everyone's home. I don't know what they can do about maintenance. I'm sure maintenance is working on buildings. But so we had to bring back all the wet laundry and we turned the office library into a pirate ship. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we did. And oh we my had, god. We had laundry everywhere. Sheets and shirts and jogging pants and oh, I hope this does not go on because we really oh need man, a dryer. That's awful. That is just awful. You know, that you might have to get to the point where you have to swing a cro- clothesline I right th- across the whole entire room. We are you thinking know? about it, yes, exactly. But happy Beltane. Today is Beltane, one of the Celtic pagan fire festivals, important for witches, oh. druids and Celtic pagans and you know Wiccans. Well, uh, well happy, happy belting to you. And I, I believe, uh, I mean, it's it's contested, but I believe today is the unofficial halfway to Halloween. Uh, yes, I, there was a couple of days I've seen it advertised, but we're in that general halfway to Halloween zone. Yeah, because April thirtieth was yesterday, and mm-hmm. there is no thirty first. Uh, so today would be the 31st if there was one. Right. But that's kind of how I look at it. But, I mean, who knows, you know. And for our audience, we are in the middle of the corona first phase. I, I have this terrible feeling when people are listening to the show in the future, it's going to be the second or third phase. But That's very was, possible. This was the beginning, and we're still in lockdown, though PA Governor Wolf is starting to open up the parks and campsite and outdoor. And you, and you want to know why? Why? It's to appease people. I think that's so. all it comes down. That, that's it. That's all it comes down to, because people are getting oh. anxious, and he he's basically throwing them a bone. Yeah. Because guess what? People, I I was out mm-hmm. four or five days ago. Yeah. I went up to the uh, distillery in Lansdale, yeah. and the park, the trails. People were walking all over the parks. Mm-hmm. They didn't need to be open. They were still walking around anyway. Right. You know, and this is just to say, oh, they're open now. Okay, well. People weren't listening before anyway, yeah, so right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And we're going to hopefully get to a park a little further out because I can't really be around people. But here's the thing. I've got all these people saying, should we drive to Lancaster? Should we go to the park? 
We want to drive out to the country, and it's like, well, yeah, you can, but remember, there are no bathrooms anywhere. Right. Nowhere. <laughs> uh, none of the parks are open. They don't open to Memorial Day anyway. But the local restaurants and Wawa's and Sheets and stuff, they're not letting people use their bathroom. So if you come out here, you, you better bring a tin can. Wow. Or a plastic bottle with a plastic cap. Plastic bottle, yeah. And this is something we got to deal with, too. But hopefully we'll get out to the parks this weekend, because I've heard about some cool local Pennsylvania cryptids. Oh, yeah? Yeah, you know, cryptid is a, like a Loch Ness monster or a Bigfoot or something. Right. We, we've talked about the Apovich before, which is a, another term for apple snitch. It's sort of the local Bigfoot in Pennsylvania. Okay. Wait, except for it's only four feet tall. That's... That's oh. as tall as Bigfoot gets in Pennsylvania. A, a four-foot-tall four foot Bigfoot. Big, four, he's got really big feet, and he's like three inches tall. Wow. No, he's like four feet. <laughs> and of course, we know that he hangs out in trees. He likes to steal apples. So he's, oh. a little per he's a little person Bigfoot. Exactly, a little person Bigfoot of Pennsylvania. That's what we got. Chickies oh. rocks, he's out there. Uh, the um, Susquehannocks, a local Native American tribe, They've seen ape-like monsters, and they've depicted them on their war shields. And he's an apple snitch. He steals apples, he hangs out in a tree, and eats them. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> now, did you know that we have our own Loch Ness Monster? No. Yeah. That is the actual way of saying it by... Try, try that. Loch. Loch Ness Monster. Loch. Yeah, that's, that's the Loch. CH. That's the guttural... Kunrakin um, Kul, which is Gaelic. It's Loch. But we have one in Huntington County, Pennsylvania. His name is Raystown Ray. Hmm. I, I kid Raystown you not. Raystown Ray. Raystown Ray. This is real. Okay. Uh, there was no lake before. 1905, Army Corps of Engineers decides to build a dam, and they create a lake, a reservoir, 28 miles long. It's 200 feet deep. Sounds wonderful to fish in. Um, and... Back in the 60s, residents start seeing their own Loch Ness monster. They, they, started, mm. they started seeing this lizard with a giant head attached to a thick snake-like neck and a huge reptilian body. Okay. Yeah. And there are actually photographs of this thing that were taken up into the 1970s and 1980s. And they even nearly canceled the race down ski club water show one year because of this thing oh jeez! oh my god <laughs> now what do you think if you were out in a boat and you saw ray come up and, and stick his head up what would you do i would i would stand there and and keep watching to see what this thing was mm -hmm. that's what i would do okay i, I would i would could because it, you, you need to get a good look at it because if you don't, when you tell people the story, they're going to ask you for details. And if you say, well, I don't know, I don't mm -hmm. remember, then it doesn't sound credible. So I would right. make sure I do a mental imprint. And yeah, I, I, wouldn't, and I don't think I'd be scared. I think I would I wouldn't run. I, I would just stand there and wait. And if it stood there and got closer to me, maybe then I would back off. But back as off, long as I had some distance, I would yeah. observe. I'd probably try to catch it. You would try and catch it. Yeah. I try to. Try well, to if I had the means to catch it, yeah. I mean, but if, if you're if you're just kind of stuck out there, you know, without any kind of you know mm -hmm. means, I would just observe. So, what? How would you go about catching it? Well, I'd use an eight pound test on my line. Probably use a lure, some corn, or maybe some mealworms. No, I would. I have no idea. I was just <laughs> saying, I'd, out there fishing for for bass or trout or something, and catch this this raised town monster on my line. And I'd probably throw it back because you can't eat that thing. You don't know where it's been. No, but you could, you know, you could keep it and you, know, you can't eat it, but you could keep it and yeah. present it to right. authorities or, you know. Okay. You know, it could end up in the Smithsonian. You never know, right? Raystown, Ray and Smithsonian. But the thing <laughs> is, it's, it's a man-made lake. They, they probably had a stream water source not more than a few feet deep. So where did this thing come from? Hmm. Maybe it came from a different lake. Maybe it could mm -hmm. walk. Can it walk? Walk it. <laughs> it decided to move one day. It's just, oh, this this lake is crap. They're building this awesome <laughs> reservoir up in Raystown, and like it's it's walked. Long. I'm going to relocate. <laughs> Picks up his suitcase and just wanders away. <laughs> I wish we had an artist to draw that. I really did. That'd be odd. That'd be odd. Uh, crap, yeah. the neighbors suck out here. I'm leaving. <laughs> 
I'm no. moving on. <laughs> Greener pastures. Now, the Butler County has their own creature. It's called the Butler County Gargoyle. Mm, okay. This sounds a lot like Mothman. Yeah. You know, like the March 2011, man's driving in Pennsylvania. He's driving up one of the rural routes. He thinks he sees a deer on the side of the road. He stops. I'm pretty sure he was hunting. And he sees this massive, leather-skinned, 10-foot-tall creature Mm -hmm. with... um, he had a head of a monster. It was sloped back, like he said, like a bicycle helmet. Right. And it had these built arms that ended in claws and legs that bent like a bird's. And I'm assuming it had a wing. Mm, okay. Yes. Wings on the flat of its back with the tips reaching up to his ears like a gargoyle. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> the butler gargoyle. Now, that month, several other motorists driving in that area, motorists, that's what the article, motorists, or several other drivers in their motor cars <laughs> saw, this, saw this thing on the side of the road. And when they approached it, or actually, I, I don't know if any of them approached it. If any of them approached it, it just sort of flies off like Mothman. Oh, wow. So they're not Mothman. just cars, they're motor cars. They're motor cars. <laughs> they're motor coaches, yes. <laughs> but so they, they saw, yeah. <laughs> but it. they saw this. That was the Butler Gargoyle. And one of the last legends, I've been, I've been picking up these stories, reading Lancaster stuff, and sort of hanging out and learning about where I live. Uh, and I also read that Pennsylvania has legends of giant white wolves. Mm, okay. Kind of a noble, nobler monster. Yeah, that is. And now there are local wolves that used to live in Pennsylvania, of course. Of course, they've mostly driven out or driven south. And we've also had cases of mountain lions up in the wolves, but these giant wolves have been reported since the days of the Pennsylvania colony. They just sound incredible. Now, obviously, they're probably legends of regular wolves that have been exaggerated, or they're referring back to some native totem spirit or spirit of the land of something like that, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I would like to see that, though, a giant white wolf. I think that would be really cool. Oh, maybe you will sometime. <laughs> Well, so it's spring. This is What Are You Afraid of? Par and Paranormal Show. We're moving into our spring season. Episode 140, Greg Bear and Bear's Ghost. We'll be getting to our interview with Greg Bear in a few minutes. We're just hanging out with Phil. Now, unfortunately for our para X for radio people, this is the extra material I was talking about. So before we go on to our interview with Greg Bear, so when the world finally opens up and we're allowed to at least somewhat function, What's the first thing you're really going to get out there and do? The first thing I'm really going to do, uh, get a haircut. (laughs) Oh, you know, okay. So the last month and a half on Facebook, every time someone complains that they want a haircut or there are no barbers or anything, I take a picture of a guy cutting his hair with a Floby and I put it up on their post and go, Floby. <laughs> well, I've been doing that. I've been cutting my own hair. Not with a Floby, but I have no. um, I have old barber shears mm-hmm. that I've been using just to trim. My, I'm, not, I'm not giving myself full-on ha- haircuts, but okay. I'm trimming my hair just okay. to keep so it under control better. so it doesn't just get, you know, super wild or anything. So mm-hmm. I have been doing that. But, I mean, as far as an actual, you know, presentable haircut, I would like to do that. Mm-hmm. And also, you know – when the time comes, I'm not, I'm not rushing into it. Uh, you know, go to the actual food store and do a shopping order. I haven't yeah. been doing that. I haven't been into an actual supermarket in two months. So, right. you know, uh, and it's probably going to be at least another month before I even attempt it. Even, yeah. even though they're open, they're open, but I'm not going in, you know. Yeah, Allison went today. Okay. You have to go early. Yeah, I know what you mean. Early. You got to go early. Uh, if you go Just, late. Yep. That's it. Yeah, the line around the it spreads into the parking lot. The most I yeah. the most I did was uh, lately was last week I went to Seven Eleven, and that mm-hmm. was only because it was I absolutely had to. I get some things uh, that, that that I ran out of, and I needed mm-hmm. it. So it was I went late though on purpose. There been twenty four hours. I went at like I think it was like eleven thirty at night. Yeah, and okay. I I went in and there was nobody, no cars. Mm-hmm. And right when I'm about to get out of the car, I have a mask. Some guy pulls up next to me, gets out. I'm like, all right, I'm waiting for this guy to go in because I, okay. you know, I don't want to even be around people in there. So he goes in, and I notice he doesn't have a mask on. He goes in without oh, a great. mask on. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. I'm like, I'm glad I yeah. wasn't in there, right? So then I, he leaves. I go in, 
I'm checking out and right and as I'm checking out, someone else comes in and they don't have a mask on either. But luckily I was like out of there within like three seconds after that anyway. So, (laughs) you know, and And then race town Ray comes in. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. He comes in for a Slurpee. He's exactly lumbering in. I want a Slurpee. Yep. (laughs) Yeah. But I, I I mean, I'm going to do a shopping order. I haven't Mm -hmm. gone to any kind of supermarket giant or Whole Foods or nothing like that. I just, I mean, for any long periods of time with an actual cart and and a full shopping order have not done it. You know, I, I won't even want to touch the carts, you know. Yeah. So what I, I did was, you know, I did uh, I did a giant order mm-hmm. and I had to wait two weeks for it. But it was like almost four hundred dollars. You, you, you select the yeah. time you go and you pick it yeah. up. They put everything in your trunk. So that's kind of what I've been doing to just stay afloat. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to the shore. Oh, so well, yeah, it, yeah. You can do that now, though. That's what it, yeah. yeah. Well, there's just nothing open. Right. I mean, even the beaches are closed, and hopefully they'll open soon. And they're trying to figure out ways to open the restaurants and the stores and sort of do it outside. It's just not It's not going to happen. No. I mean, there's no way. They're not enforcing social distancing. As soon as the beach is open, that's it. it no one's going to follow these rules. They're not doing it now. But as soon as Allison and I see the all clear at least the semi clear take precautions yeah. i think we're going to hop in the car and go right to the beach we're not stopping there you go <laughs> that's it and hopefully i'll get the fish this weekend oh before we jump over to our interview with greg bear i have some good news what's that the book bub feature for mercy yeah which is actually quite hard to get from what i've been learning did a tremendous amount of good for the book really and my royalties from bloodbound books have shot up wonderful yeah and you can say i mean that's really the biggest test it's not just the reviews it's the money you're making every month and when you see those numbers going up that's when you know a book is successful that's wonderful congratulations i'm happy for you thank you yeah it's been a fight and it's been a fight to get my name out there and build promotion and sometimes you catch a break yeah yeah there are links at the website where you can find Mercy at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com, where you're going to find all 140 of our episodes, our archive of ghost stories with narrated components, which I'm constantly updating, plus interviews and a lot of other cool features over at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com. Of course, find us at Friday nights at 9 p.m. on Para X Radio Eastern Time, and we've just got some really cool stuff coming up like a jack the ripper episode uh we talked to paul and tina that was when paul dixon a you know paranormal investigator and the psychic detective we've got some cool authors coming up some paranormal stuff coming up and some surprise guests that are going to be quite exciting yeah it's uh, i'm looking forward to all that yeah i've got some developments on that yeah that's some- i don't want to say anything now i would never like to announce no. it until we actually get it recorded right because we've had some people flake out on us. Sometimes, yeah, don't count, you know, don't count mm-hmm. your chickens <laughs> before they're Don't hatched. count your race down Ray before he right. finds his lake. <laughs> well, yeah. we, we'll be right back on What Are You Afraid of Harm Paranormal Show with our part two of the interview with science fiction legend Greg Bear. We talk about artificial intelligence, writing, his brushes with death, and he gives some great advice to new authors out there. So, we'll be right back. This is T-Fox. And this is Phil. Are you haunted by shadow people in the middle of the night? Do you secretly love all things creepy and spooky, enjoying ghost stories and horror fiction from the best storytellers? Do you have a true ghost experience you want to share, but no one will believe you? If yes, listen to the professionals on What Are You Afraid of? Horror Paranormal Show, Friday nights at 9pm on Para X Radio and at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com. What are you afraid of on Para X? Our creepy and demented hosts are on call to provide you with all your spooky needs with true ghost stories, interviews, indie music, and new horror fiction. We are ready ready to to scare scare you. Para X. Science fiction author Greg Bear was born in San Diego, California, on August 20th, 1951, to Wilma and Dale Bear. His father was in the Navy, and by the time he was 12 years old, Greg had traveled with his parents to Japan, the Philippines, and Alaska, as well as touring various parts of the United States. 
At 10 while living in Alaska, he finished his first story. At 15, he sold his first story to famous science fiction. By 23, he was publishing frequent work. Greg would go on to write many novels and short stories, helping to define modern science fiction. Books like Killing Titan and War Dogs and Hall Zero Three and City at the End of Time and, of course, Darwin's Radio. How are you? I'm glad to talk to you guys. Greg, could you describe to us how the first AI will evolve and how it will change human culture? Well, right now we've got a lot of uh, uh, really interesting systems that can do voice recognition, facial recognition. That's only developed in the last 20 years. That voice recognition has really become useful, and that's fascinating to watch. Not 100%, but it's still very, very good. But this is still not artificial intelligence. Uh, intelligence involves... Uh, users. It involves individuals that may have a connection with a society or with other individuals, but they have their own motivations and their own needs. And what we have right now are all machines. They're basically right. tools. We right. have yet to build an artificial user. Mm. And that's mm. that's going to be interesting. When you do that, then I'll start being frightened. But right now, <laughs> these are all interesting and complicated and very, very interesting you know, a- applications for tools. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's like you said, um, when the when the machines rise up, you know, <laughs> the machines are and we'll be scared. I honestly then we'll be scared. I look at it as natural evolution. I really do. As far as I'm concerned, if AI is born and AI is not going to be created from scratch, it's going to be modeled on human intelligence. It's another form of procreation. So if AI took over the Earth and the humans died out one way or another, I would feel comfortable with that. As far as I was concerned, it would be the evolution of, hu- of humans into the next stage. Mm. In so a way, that, yeah, because it's, it's, it's our creation. Mm-hmm. You, know? you got it. Have you guys read Childhood's End? Or oh, yes. TV? Oh, yes. <laughs> I love that TV show. It is so uh-huh. sad and it's so brilliantly a recreation of Clark's book. You Phil, know, the, the, yeah. this... This is really an interesting uh, uh, story Mm -hmm. that goes back to Stapledon again. You know, the succession of species over billions of years Mm -hmm. in his novels is is pretty sad and pretty amazing. Um, But, you know, I don't think that's going to happen with artificial intelligence because, A, it's not there yet. And if it is there, are we going to make them like ourselves? That's a that's a pretty key question. A lot of people involved in artificial intelligence design don't think that's strictly necessary. We do have mm. the need to procreate, though. We do have the need to create legacy. So it's possible just out of almost human vanity or the human need to continue procreating, especially as we recognize so many extinction-level events could be right around the door and researching our own history. <laughs> that that well, invest- certainly yeah. Yeah. That investing ourselves... I, wa- I watched... Um- I watched AI a few nights ago. That Steven Spielberg film, uh, Steven Spielberg slash Stanley Kubrick, I should say, because Kubrick, I think, worked on it. Yeah. Have you guys seen that? Have you guys ever? I I, th- I think it's a brilliant film, and again, it follows along, kind of like with Childhood's End, follows along with the basic notion of uh, of Stapleton and Clark, but also Kubrick, that we are not made to create artificial intelligence because we don't know how to take care of them. Mm. Oh, that's a good one. Think of 2001, where Hal is basically badly programmed to, into a crisis stage. And then think of, of uh, the poor, the poor uh, uh, kid in uh, AI, where he's basically not designed very well, because he's A, clinging, which is not yeah. always attractive. He cannot grow or evolve into another creature. He's just a doll with, with emotions. And that, of course, follows along with the oldest idea in science fiction, which is Frankenstein's monster was was basically badly raised. You know, had mm-hmm. a, had a terrible father who didn't know how to take care of him. And uh, and it, it, you take that down to uh, to Hal to AI, uh, and and it, it's a, a standard theme in science fiction. If you're going to build AIs, you have to be wise to make it right. Absolutely. What was the original short story called? Um, summer fun or fun toys last all summer long. That AI was based on. Super toys last all summer long. Yeah. Mm. 
Brian Altus worked on that, and there's an interesting story behind that. Brian's short story was kind of the basis of what Clark developed, but he developed over many, many years. And Brian faded out with Clark early on, got kind of tired of working with them. So they brought in uh, other writers, uh, uh, Ian Watson, and Ian Watson uh, was one of Brian's literary enemies in England. <laughs> oh. But he worked mm. wow. better, better with Kubrick. And uh, and eventually they had to share credit on the origin of the story. So that was an interesting folding together of two writers of great interest. And I like both Brian and Ian, and I think that was an interesting moment in literary history. It was Kubrick. It was Spielberg. But what happened was they got together, and Kubrick was trying to do AI. Spielberg was trying to do Eyes Wide Shut, and they just didn't have the setup for it. So they decided to right. switch. Huh. Oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Spielberg got AI, he took it over from Kubrick, and Kubrick took over Eyes Wide Shut. Childhood's End. It's one of my absolute favorite books. It's more of a novella, really. And it just, it's so brilliant. In fact, he even writes in it that it is not his view of the future. He's much more of an optimist. He said, this is just a story. This isn't a, a, a prophecy. I'm not prognosticating. It's just a story idea I had. But I don't believe this is where we're headed. He was so careful to protect his legacy. And it's such a great book. And Sci-Fi Channel did a three-part miniseries, which you can find on Amazon Prime. And I really want you to, after you read the book, it's so amazing and dark and frightening and he draws in all these biblical images i don't want to give it away and i even got my wife to watch it we were driving to pittsburgh to see her grandmother and she absolutely loves childhood's end she read it and she watched it and just such a great book but we're going to pause here with this incredible interview with one of my one of my idols mr greg bear we're going to play an excerpt from his book Deadlines, which was out in 2005 from Ballantine Books. Peter Russell, formerly a successful director of soft porn films, is in a career slump. Unable to compete with the new market for hardcore pornography, he accepts an offer to promote a new type of analog cell phone called Trans with Global Reach. Requiring no network of relay towers, but the makers of Trans are really hiring Peter for his connection with Joseph Benoli an aging billionaire who can provide much-needed startup capital. The technology utilized by Trans uses the nearly unlimited quantum bandwidth by which subatomic particles communicate with each other, and when users of Trans begin to see ghosts, Peter gradually discovers that Trans has tapped into a channel where human memories are stored and survive the death of the body. Unfortunately, Trans has made a noise and awakened nameless things much older than human beings who feed on souls and memories. Our wonderful David Walton is reading this excerpt, and he's so thrilled that we have you on the show, Mr. Bear, our wonderful David Walton in Plymouth. And he is going to read this excerpt from this book, Deadlines, on What Are You Afraid of? Horror and Paranormal Show on Parix Radio. Friday nights at 9 p.m. And check out our website at www.whatareyoufraidofpodcast.com for all of our previous episodes. We have a page for each. Links to all these things we're talking about, you can find it there as long as I'm feeling strong enough to get the page up. Plus our archive of true ghost stories narrated by our voice actors and new articles and material that you can't get on the audio show. I'm doing a series of interviews with Crash Code authors from the anthology from... Bloodbound books, I'm very happy to have been in it, plus blog entries and book reviews and things like that. This is David Walton reading from Deadlines, and we'll be back on What Are You Afraid Of? Mercy, a new horror medical thriller from author T. Fox Dunham, published by Bloodbound Books. Based on the author's horrific battle with a rare form of lymphoma that involved intense chemotherapy and radiation, Fox turns the horror of his experience into terror on the page. William Sane is dying of cancer. On most days, death seems like a humane alternative to the treatment. Stricken with fever, William is rushed to mercy, notorious as a place to send the sickest of the poor and uninsured to be forgotten, and finds the hospital in even worse condition than his previous visit. Willie's memories faded. He grabbed his sack head, the sack head of the scarecrow, picking at the exposed chicken wire to hold them in. However, the memories fell out of the holes in his face, 
They wormed and crawled from the leather flesh and the old clothing of the scarecrow, then squirmed and wiggled down his body. The grounds are unkempt, the foundation is cracking, and like the wild mushrooms sprouting from the fissures of decay around it, something is growing inside the hospital. Something dark. Fangoria gives Mercy 3.5 out of 4 skulls. Dunham has channeled his many brushes with the other side into the exquisitely rendered lyrical supernatural hospital thriller Mercy. It's feeding on the sickness and sustaining itself on the staff, changing them. And now, it wants Willie. Come now, Mr. Saint. Just a little more of that sweet mail. Mm-mm-mm. So salty and so good. You won't miss it. And we ever do so like our delicacies here at Mercy Hospital. Part medical horror, part supernatural suspense, Mercy is a hard-hitting fever dream of a novel. I enjoyed the hell out of it. Tim Wagner, author of The Way of All Flesh and Eat the Night. Available from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and bookstores everywhere in both print and digital versions. Life is an addiction. Let go. Let it all burn. Opening excerpt from the novel Dead Lines. Written by Greg Bear. Published by Ballantine Books and read by David Walton. Paul is dead. Call home. Peter Russell, stocky and greying, stood on the sidewalk and squinted at the text message on his cell phone, barely visible in the afternoon sun on Ventura Boulevard. He lifted his round glasses above small, amused eyes and brought the phone closer to see the display more clearly. Paul is dead. He flashed on his youth when for a week he had sincerely believed that Paul was dead. Paul McCartney, I am the walrus. But he had misread the phone's blocky letters The message was actually, Phil is dead. That shook him. He knew only one Phil. Peter had not talked with Phil Richards in a month, but he refused to believe that the message referred to his best friend of 35 years, the kinder, weaker, and almost certainly more talented of the two Ps. Not the Phil with the 32-foot Grand Tager motorhome, keeper of their eternal plans for the world's longest old fart cross-country hot dog escapade and tour. Please, not that Phil. He hesitated before hitting callback. What if it was a joke? A bit of cell phone spam? Peter drove a vintage Porsche 356C Coupe that had once been signal red and was now roughly the shade of a dry brick. He fumbled his key and almost dropped the phone before unlocking the car door. He did not need this. He had an important appointment. Angrily, he pushed the button. The number rolled out in musical beats. He recognised the answering voice of Carla Vies, whom he had not heard from in years. She sounded nervous and a little guilty. Peter, I just dropped by the house. I took the key from your bell and let myself in. There was a note. My God, I never meant to snoop. It's from somebody named Lydia. Lydia was Phil's ex-wife. I thought I should let you know. Peter had shown Carla the secret of the bronze Soleri bell hanging outside the front door after a night of very requited passion. Now, upset, she was having a sandwich and a root beer from his refrigerator. She hoped he didn't mind. Mi casa es su casa, Peter said, beyond irritation. He tongued at the small gap between his front teeth. I'm listening. Carla's voice was shaky. All right, the note reads, Dear Peter, Phil died. He had a heart attack or a stroke. They aren't sure which. We'll let you know details. 
Then it signed very neatly. She took a breath. Wasn't he another writer? Didn't I meet him here in the house? Yeah. Peter pressed his eyes with his fingers, blocking out the glare. Lydia had been living in Burbank for a few years. She had apparently made the rounds of Phil's LA friends. Carla rattled on, saying that Lydia had used a fountain pen, a folded sheet of handmade paper, a black satin ribbon, and scotch tape. Lydia had never liked telephones. Phil is dead. 35 years of kid dreams and late night plans, sitting in the backyard in old radar dish rattan chairs on the dry grass between the junipers, shooting the bull about stories and writing and big ideas, Phil hanging out on movie sets and model shoots, not so selfless, but also helping Peter carry his bulky and unsold wire sculptures to the dump in the back of the old Ford pickup they had often swapped. Only the truck, never the women, Phil had lamented. Slight, wiry Phil, with the short, mousy hair, who smiled so sweetly every time he saw a naked lady, who longed for the female sex with such clumsy devotion. Are you okay, Peter? Carla asked from far away. Heart attack, Peter repeated, lifting the phone back to his mouth. Or a stroke, they aren't sure. It's a very pretty note, really. I'm so sorry. He visualised Carla in his house, locked in her perpetual late thirties, leggy as a deer, dressed in pedal pushers and dazzling man's white dress shirt, with sleeves rolled up and tails pinned, to show her smooth, flat tummy. Thanks, Carla. You better leave before Helen comes over, Peter said, not unkindly. I'll put the key back in the bell, Carla said. And Peter, I was looking through your files. Do you have some glosses of me that I can borrow? I have a new agent, a good guy, really sharp, and he wants to put together a fresh folio. I'm up for a credit card commercial. All of Carla's agents had been good guys, really sharp. All of them had screwed her both ways, and she never learned. I'll look, Peter said, though he doubted Cheesecake would help. You know where to find me. He did, and also what she smelled and felt like. With a wave of loose guilt, Peter sat on the old seat in the car's sunned interior, the door half open and one leg hanging out. The hot, cracked leather warmed his balls. A cream-coloured Lexus whizzed by and honked. He pulled in his leg and shut the door, then rolled down the window as far as it would go, about halfway. Sweat dripped down his neck. He had to look presentable and be in Malibu in an hour. His broad face crinkled above a close, trimmed, peppered beard. Peter was 58 years old, and he couldn't afford to take 10 minutes to cry for his best friend. One hand shielded his eyes from sun and traffic. Damn it, Phil, he said. He started the car and took the back roads to his home a square, flat-roofed 50s rambler in the Glendale Hills. Carla was gone by the time he arrived, leaving only a waft of gardenia in the warm, still air on the patio. Helen was late, or maybe not coming after all. He could never tell what her final plans might be, so he took a quick shower. He soon smelled of soap and washed skin and put on a blue and red Hawaiian shirt. He picked up his best briefcase, a maroon leather job, and pushed through the old French doors. The weedy jasmine creeping over the trellis had squeezed out a few flowers, 
their sweetness curled up alongside Carla's gardenia. Peter stood for a moment on the red tiles and looked up through the trellis at the bright blue sky. He pressed his elbow against a rough, sun-battered post, breath coming hard. The old anxiety he always found in tight places, in corners and shadows. When events fell outside his control or his ability to escape. A minute passed. Two minutes. Peter's gasping slowed. He sucked in a complete breath and pressed the inside of his wrist with two fingers to check his pulse. Not racing. The hitch behind his ribs untied with a few solid pushes of cupped fingers under the edge of his sternum. He had never asked a doctor why that worked, but it did. He wiped his face with a paper towel, then scrawled a note for Helen on the smudged blackboard nailed beneath the Soleri bell. Reaching into the oil drum that served as an outdoor closet, mounted high on two sawhorses, he tugged out a lightweight suit coat of beige silk, the only one he had, a thrift store purchase from six years ago. He sniffed it, not too musty, good for another end of summer, soon to turn into autumn. Sunday nights at midnight on the Staring Into the Abyss radio show. Come, get lost with us. <laughs> we are back with this incredible show. I'm having a lot of fun. And, I mean, we have a terrible virus happening outside. A lot of people really can't predict what's going to happen. We have so many doctors who have Facebook medical degrees predicting based on their own needs and their own interpretations. And really, we're just sort of hunkered down inside reading our books, working on our stories, waiting and watching the human race change. But we are back on What Are You Afraid of Horror and Paranormal? Are you having a fun show, Phil? Oh, absolutely. This is great. I'm having a blast. Talking about my absolute favorite, Darwin's Radio. So, Darwin's Radio, let me tell you a little a little bit about it, Phil. It's about a virus, and this is what made me think of this. I thought, God, we were under an epidemic. Wouldn't it be great to get Greg Bear on the show? So Darwin's Radio is about a retrovirus, and he taught me the concept of the retrovirus. It's a virus, and he'll probably correct me on something, I'm sure. It's a virus that when it enters your system, it actually rewrites your DNA a little bit and then takes from your DNA, adds to itself, moves along to the next host, and does the same DNA exchange. And what you have, yeah, what you have is this potential to start rewriting animals, the species. And in his book, they accelerate. And what looks like a terrible disease may actually be the creation of the next evolution of humankind. And that was Darwin's radio. And of course, people are frightened of it, and they're trying to stop it, because they're threatened by it. Yeah. So, Mr. Bear, I just loved your book. It's absolutely one of my favorite of all time, that one and its follow-up. And I always, I always recommend it to people. So, where did the idea for Darwin's radio come from, and how did you develop that into a full novel? Well, back in the 1980s, I was thinking, you know, what do viruses do for us while they're causing disease? They can't just be causing disease. It's rare that you have a, a partnership in biology that doesn't go both ways, for some instances at least. And so I was thinking about, uh, okay, let, let, how can you create uh, an artificial cell that is itself intelligent? And that led mm -hmm. me to write blood music. Uh, as a short story and then later as a novel. And so I did a lot of biological research. But in the early 90s, I realized, you know, I'm not sure I quite believe the standard theory of evolution you know, as, as being totally random. I think there's something else going on here. So I had to figure out what that was. And I said, okay, how do cells, how do individuals communicate with each other? 
Well, you know, the, uh, the way that, that bacteria communicate with each other is they have plasmids and, and phages. And phages are viruses that affect only bacteria. So these phages will carry genes from one bacterial organism to another. And sometimes they carry toxic genes, and so they can convert different viruses and so on into, into nasty viruses like cholera and so on. And bacteria can become vibrio cholera by the ad- addition of a couple of toxic genes carried by phages. So where is the equivalent for humanity? What are the genes that carry these things for humanity? And as, as I was doing this, I was, I might have to invent this. And then the more research I did, I realized I don't need to invent this. They already exist. There's a lot of a lot of endogenous retroviruses, which we call human endogenous retroviruses, that have been in the genome for millions and millions of years and express. Interestingly, they generally express only in pregnant women, and their major role is to help suppress the immune system so the fetus is not affected by the mother's immune system. Hmm. So mothers actually have reduced immune systems because of the babies they're carrying, and these. Hmm. It's endogenous retroviruses are part of that. I won't get into how that connects with HIV and AIDS, although it kind of does. Uh, but the, the whole thing then becomes, okay, these are, are, are viruses that can carry genes between individuals. And so that's what the whole theory behind Darwin's radio was, is let me learn more about viruses and how they exchange and about these endogenous retroviruses, which were not all that commonly known back in the 1980s and 90s. And let's talk about the history of biological science and its ignorance of how evolution really works and how that can make us weaker. And then I had a character, uh, Kay Lang, who is about to undergo this sort of thing. She's about to do research on herself in a time of great stress by making herself pregnant. And she's going to produce one of these new children and see what happens. And she goes through the whole process, which is characterized in, in Darwin's radio. And Darwin's children... The babies born in that time period, which is a very, very complicated and, and kind of a, a difficult, sad time period, the babies born in that time period are becoming teenagers. Mm. And so they have their own you know, characteristics. They're the new species. They're more capable of communicating with each other. Uh, they have broader bandwidth because of their vocal systems, which are kind of bilingual uh, instantly, and also their facial patterns, which have kind of chromatophores and they can signal to each other, and also they control their own scent glands, so they can communicate through scent as well. And this new kind of species is much higher bandwidth than the old human species. And so that's that was the idea behind Darwin's Radio and later Darwin's Children. It's just such a wonderful book, and you did, I mean, you, you definitely have incredible knowledge of science and a grasp of science and technology, but you're also an author because you took those ideas and my favorite part, and this, I remember reading this at 2 a.m., I couldn't put it down, and I really felt for the couple. Like you said, she wanted to let the pregnancy go forward. A lot of people were trying to terminate it. They believed it was a disease that was going to kill them, but she wanted to see... She trusted nature. She trusted the goddess. She trusted nature. She trusted evolution, and she wanted to let it go forward. And they were sort of running and hiding from the government, just like Joseph and Mary trying (laughs) trying to get to the inn while they're being hunted by king herod and all these people who are trying to stop this incredible change they were so threatened because the status quo was being threatened human power was being threatened and change was coming and i'll never forget reading they were so in love and they were so intimate together and they were protecting each other trying to bring their baby into the world and that's where you really transgressed you went beyond just the science idea and created a passionate human story and it's just one of my favorite themes i've modeled so much of my own work on those moments where they're running and they're hiding and they're in love and just trying to bring their baby into the world and trusting each other and trusting that whatever came from their love would have to be beautiful and pure and just where she gives up science and has faith instead how old were you when you read it i had just gone through that summer of chemo that really intense chop they gave me the cytox and the octavin and um, I, Mr. Bear doesn't know, but I was diagnosed with a very rare, I don't, I'll just say very, I hate modifiers, a rare type of cancer. Only none other people in the world have had my kind of lymphoma. No one had survived it before. I had a weird 
combination of Hodgkin cells and large cells in the tumors mm-hmm. that they were they were finding. I was 19 when I was diagnosed. So I went through intense chemotherapy and then I had six months of radiation. The radiation was every day, full mantle, face, chest. And I was recovering and it was when I was recovering and sort of rebuilding myself that I found a copy of Darwin's radio on the bookshelf at Barnes & Noble. And I was intrigued by the concept and I brought it home. So I would say about, I, I just don't want to give the age because it was more than the age. I read it at such a time when I was completely broken open to new ideas. I was so protean and I was such soft clay and it just had such a remarkable effect on me. And at that point, I wasn't trusting nature at all. I certainly wasn't trusting thermodynamics, but reading Darwin's, yeah, (laughs) reading Darwin's radio made me feel like there was love and hope in these constructs of nature that maybe there was an idea, a unifying idea that brought it all together in the end, and that maybe something beautiful could come from it. Of course, uh, Darwin's Children was all about, like you were saying, about these adolescents growing up and the way society began to fear them. And I remember in the beginning, uh, they were studying archaeological finds of early man, of Neanderthal and Homo sapiens, the early early versions. And it had always been believed that they had killed each other, that the early man had killed Neanderthal. But, but really, in your book, at the end, they discovered that instead of killing each other, they had worked together and interbred into a new species. Which we're find, finding more and more now. Fortunately, I, I got some of that right. I, you know, I, I uh, had to play a little bit with this notion that the kids would be uh, having to adapt to the new faces uh, with their parents, and the parents would. But, but, but the whole point was that I never did believe that Neanderthals and and others were primitive or preceded us and just died off, you know, that we replaced them. They never seemed quite likely to me. And now we're finding so many genetic analyses that show that all of these prior species contributed to us that that I think I didn't get it completely right, but in the sense it's emotionally correct that all of these early species are carried in our genomes, you know, and, and I really love that. But certainly what you what you went through is, is so extraordinary, and in a sense, I'm fortunate I never had to go through that. Uh, but in in nineteen four uh, in twenty fourteen, uh, I died. Basically, mm. I had a, a, a thing I'd never heard of before called an aortic dissection, which is very hard to find. And suddenly one day I started having a chest pain, and I said, "This isn't a heart attack." So I called up the. Uh, the emergency room, and they sent out a, a thing, and they hauled me into the hospital, and then they hauled me to another hospital, and there I was given a procedure I'd never knew about, uh, despite all the research I'd done, which was they replaced my aorta and my valve, and saved me. I woke up wow. the next morning instead of dying, and that was Good. pretty extraordinary. But you know what you've been through is a lot harder because it's more extended and and kind of more suspenseful. Uh, so I, I got I got to give kudos to you for all that you've survived. Uh, this is nothing compared to you know uh, what I've been through is nothing compared to what you're going through and have been through. You know I hear that and I always say I don't like to compare. Everyone's pain is their own. Right. Everyone's suffering is their own. The extent of that, and it's funny. In people, people, I appreciate what you're saying, and I thank you. It's just people always they're they're like, well, you survived it. You're strong. You somehow found the strength to overcome this. And it's it's not like that. It's yeah. not that you're finding the strength to overcome that I suddenly, you know, grew into this lion and attacked the cancer, even though there were there were a lot of mental exercises that you did that where you summoned your totem animal, and you can probably guess what my totem animal is. Um and so and like killing a cancer does visualization, but really you don't survive cancer you don't fight cancer you just hang on while doctors you know torture the hell out of you (laughs) yeah just survive right you're relying on the painful Mm -hmm. uh, help of friends right Mm -hmm. a lot of friends are going to help you get through Mm -hmm. this and uh, sometimes you know sometimes they're going to cause you pain and sometimes they're going to be there to support you but this, this is what I found out, and I'm sure you found it out, and, and you've got to be thankful for the medical community that right now is not getting that much support from our society because right. of the stupidity of our politics. These people are the ones who saved us. 
and yet they're being put through hell now themselves. So I, 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 I want this time to be over. I want it to end well, and I want us to start acquiring the wisdom to understand who's really here to help us. And Greg, if let's say if, if you had a time machine, and, and we're pretty sure that you do, and you could go <laughs> back into the past, <laughs> yeah, we and, and you could go back into the past to see yourself as a starting author, what advice would you give to yourself? I don't think I would give myself advice. It's the process you go through without knowing the future that determines who you are and what you're going to be doing. And I, I was very lucky that my parents were very supportive. Uh, my mother wanted me to be an architect, but she gave up after I says, you know, being an architect, give me time to write. So <laughs> she says, okay. And they were very proud of me later on too. So also the people that I met at science fiction conventions and of course Ray Bradbury and Ray Harryhausen and all the people that I loved that we would meet and, and write about and all that sort of thing. I actually had a very good upbringing because in Southern California, you're right next door to the film community and you're right next door to Forey Ackerman and Ray Bradbury is just up the, up the ways. And, you know, go to conventions and there are all these writers who you're reading that you can meet and you can buy them a drink if you're of age and you can sit down and chat with them. And they are all, I found out that nearly all my favorite writers were perpetual teenagers. Hmm. You, right. look, you go, okay, this guy is, he's Jack Williamson. He's 90 years old. And he's still a teenager inside there. And Ray yeah. Bradbury is still be. a teenager. You know, and, and all the people I, I came to know and love at conventions and came to meet and, and, and get calls from and all that stuff, all of these people carried on the enthusiasm of their youth. And that was the greatest lesson. And so I already kind of learned that lesson. And, you know, the time we were helping create Comic-Con, it was just to pass that on to other people. We love all of these things. We love comic books. We love movies. We love books. We love all of these things. Let's do a convention that, that recognizes all of them. And mm. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of afraid, I think, the Comic-Con this year may not go on. I don't, I don't have any news about that. But, uh, but, you know, this convention, our love brings together, I think, about a billion dollars a year to San Diego, our old hometown. Oh, yeah. And, and including, you know, the taxes and, and the revenues and all that stuff, that's a pretty fascinating thing to love. You know, if, you, if the things you love help do that for the city you were born in, then you've got to keep loving stuff. That's all I can say. Excellent. Excellent, sir. So we're, we're kind of winding down. You, you're obviously in touch with the community. You're obviously in touch with a lot of authors, new and older. Uh, what's the biggest mistake you see new authors making in today's industry? I don't know that they're making this mistake, but my thing is, if you're not writing what you love, you're not doing it right. If you, if you really love what you're doing, uh, it's going to show in your work. And if you don't, uh, you got to find what you love and write about that. And this I learned from Bradbury and, and a lot of other writers as well. That, that, that if, you're, if you're trying to do something somebody else wants you to do, they should be paying you a lot of money to do it. But if you mm -hmm. want to write the kind of thing that you love, you should be willing to pay others to do that too. And so, mm -hmm. you know, being allowed to do that in my life is one of the great privileges of my life. Is I think mostly entirely I've been allowed to write what I love. And that even includes some of the media presentations. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm doing these media books like the Star Wars and Star Trek and so on, I love Star Trek. I like Star Wars a lot. And I was able to, I was given the freedom to find what I loved about them and express that. Oh, I know exactly okay. what, what you're talking about. When I did the Halo books, the same thing. Suddenly realized they're giving me the chance to write their origin story. Well, hmm. how cool is that? Let's bring in science fiction and what I loved about science fiction and let's put it back full circle. And that's been very, very rewarding for me as well. One of the great, mm. great pleasures that I will always remember in this life was having the chance to write for the Stargate franchise. Yeah. And I had the chance to write a short story. They asked if I wanted to do Stargate or Stargate Atlantis. I picked Stargate Atlantis. And I had ambition. I wanted to write the last story of the Asgard. I don't know if you're a Stargate, a Stargate fan. Yeah, but yeah. I wanted to write the last story of the Asgard. I wanted to write about Hermiod and how the Asgard chose the human race to be the caretakers and the inheritors of their advanced knowledge. And I wrote the story, 
and they the publisher took it you know of course stargate was done on television and then joseph maluzzi and the producers they accepted the story as canon cool and, and so yeah. my story hermiad's last mission will always be the last story of the asgard and it's considered canon in the series and it was just one of the greatest pleasures of my life i always have that no matter how much i suffer no matter how much i fail because you're gonna fail a lot i have that gift to me from stargate where i was able to contribute to that great story greg do you have any parting wisdom you like to give the writers listening to the show right now yeah go out and buy my books <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, words of wisdom from, from words all of wisdom the yes. i knew as well you know the, i've got a fantasy novel coming out in february of next year called the unfinished land and i've only written a few fantasies but boy sometimes i concentrate what i really love into fantasies and i think this one is going to be pretty special it's set around the time of the spanish armada and it involves the origins of mythology and history and everything else all rolled up into one and it's it was great fun to write it and uh, it's it's i think it's going to be quite special that's one of my great loves is historic fiction i'm working on a uh, a civil war short story set at the burning of richmond but it's not the confederates who burn their own city it's a dragon that they've raised <laughs> but <laughs> but but i'm locked in the story because there's so much historical detail you know, I, I love I love the work, and to really write good historical fiction, fantasy, science fiction, whatever, you have to love it. You have to be a student of it for years and years. You can't just decide to write a story in World War II, go out and get six books, and then you can write it. You have to build an erudition. But I'm just trying to get this story going because um, I love this stuff, but I'm just locking my down into too much detail. Locking myself down in too much detail. However, I think if I go and get that bottle of Stole and Wolf whiskey, <laughs> the rye whiskey, that my wife has sent me a picture of the empty glass. You know what Robert E. Lee said about whiskey? What's that? I can't drink it. It tastes too damn good. <laughs> Wonderful. That's incredible. I love that. Greg, it's been one of the great thrills of doing this show. Well, you know, and one thing we haven't covered is my ghost stories. So... My friends and I spent a night at the haunted hotel room at the Hotel Del Coronado in San Diego, which was the inspiration for, I think, uh, was it uh, Bid Time Return? And, okay. Uh, so, you know, we, we didn't see any ghosts there, though, but I'll tell you about the times I did see ghosts. We can also have Greg back. I'll spoil my scientific cred forever if we do that, so maybe I can do <laughs> <laughs> Great. That's that's what we get. Oh, what are you afraid of? The hell with them. They ruined Greg Bear's <laughs> reputation. That's that's the legacy me and the whiskey want to leave. And I was just thrilled like a little schoolgirl squeeing over here. Fox said before we started talking to you, he said, I'm I'm really excited to have Greg on. Like I, I I'm he's kind of seriously like, you know, like like a like a schoolgirl, you know, like I'm yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> it's done yeah. a great job and I look forward to doing this again sometime. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you Thank so you, much, sir. Greg. We'll talk later. Talk to you later. Have fun. Well, this has been a great episode. This is What Are You Afraid of Hiring Paranormal Show. We're on Pararex Radio, Friday nights at 9 p.m. And check out our website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com for a page for every episode, an archive of ghost stories, new articles, new interviews. I'm doing the interviews for Crash Code for Bloodbound Books, plus book reviews and a whole other, a lot of cool content and thank you david walton for doing such a brilliant job he really makes the show oh yeah he, he's he does an incredible job every single time this is t fox dunham and i'm phil thomas if you're not writing what you love you're not doing it right T. Fox Dunham lives in Philadelphia with his wife, Allison. He's a lymphoma survivor, cancer patient, modern bard, and historian. His first book, The Street Martyr, was published by Gutter Books. A television series based on the book is being produced by Throughline Films. Destroying the tangible illusion of reality or searching for Andy Kaufman, a book about what it's like to be dying of cancer, was released from Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing, and Fox's story in the Stargate Anthology Points of Origin from MGM and Fandemonium Books. Fox is an active member of the Horror Writers Association, and he's had published hundreds of short stories and articles. His motto is Wrecking Civilization, One Story at a Time. 
Find out more information at www.tfoxdunham.com. Phil Thomas is an author and screenwriter from the suburbs of Philadelphia. His screenplays have been produced into two feature films, False Face and Always from Darkness, and are available in major retailers such as Best Buy and Target, as well as availability on Netflix and Amazon Prime On Demand. His screenplay, Three Tunnels, was a semi-finalist at the LA Screenplay Competition. He is a member of the International Association of Professional Writers and Editors, and he currently writes for Cultured Vultures, Game Skinny, and BloodyDisgusting.com. He formerly held the position of Senior Marketing Manager at Eternal Press, and was a journalist for Patch, where he wrote a daily tech column covering the latest electronics and gadgets. He lives in the suburbs of Philadelphia and is currently working on his second novel, Worst Afterlife Ever. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors.